I propose to begin this lecture with a rather long quotation from William James. It's extremely relevant to our purpose, and it has a great deal of charm, as all James's writing has. This is what he says. To know one type of mind, is it given uh, to discern the totality of truth? Something escapes the best of us, not accidentally, but systematically, and because we have a twist. The scientific academic mind and the feminine mystical mind shy away from each other's uh, facts, just as they shy from each other's temper and spirit. Facts are there only for those who have a mental affinity with them. When once they are indisputably ascertained and admitted, the academic and critical minds are by far the best fitted ones uh, to interpret them uh, and, uh, and discuss them. For surely to pass from mystical to scientific speculations is like passing from lunacy to sanity. But on the other hand, if there is anything which human history demonstrates, it is the extreme slowness with which the ordinary academic and critical mind acknowledges facts to exist, which present themselves as wild facts with no stall or pigeonhole, or as facts which threaten to break up the accepted system. In psychology, physiology, and medicine, Whenever a debate between the mystics and the scientifics has been once for all decided, it is the mystics who have usually proved to be right about the facts, while the scientifics have had the better of it in respect to theories. Now the <laughs> reluctance of the scientifics, the academic and critical minds, to accept wild facts, facts which don't fit into the current uh, theories, it has of course been recognized long before James uh, drew attention to it. It was recognized, for example, by Lord Chesterfield when he said that <clears throat> if someone in our days were indubitably dubitably to rise from the dead, the Archbishop of Canterbury would be the first to deny it. <laughs> and it uh, it was recognized again by one of the early British historians of science, Playfair, in the end of the 18th century, where he spoke about the difficulty with which uh, people who had, so to say, a, an intellectual vested interest in an idea, the difficulty that they had in changing their ideas. Uh, and uh, similarly, we find this, um, uh, this uh, trait of reluctance to accept wild facts, going right on through the 19th century. A particularly flagrant example of this is the attitude of the official scientific mind towards what used to be called animal magnetism, which came to be called after the days of James Braid, hypnotism. This is a really extraordinary story. When you find men like Lord Kelvin saying that Hypnotism is half fraud and half bad observation. And when you find uh, doctors, for example, eminent surgeons used to say in the early days when any, uh, before anesthetics, when amputations were performed under, in the mesmeric trance, they used to say it was quite obvious that the man who was having his leg cut off was merely pretending not to feel pain, just in order to spite the doctors. <laughs> And other surgeons admitted that he probably wasn't feeling pain, but they said he ought to feel pain because pain was very good for people. <laughs> and uh, the most extraordinary and monstrous example of the, this behavior towards people who made experiments in this field uh, is the case of James Esdale, the young Scottish surgeon who went to India and performed several hundred uh, major operations, many of which had never been performed before under mesmeric uh, trance. And the, the most startling fact uh, was that not only did he perform these operations without pain to his patients, uh, 
He also performed them with a, a then incredibly low mortality rate. The standard mortality rate of, after surgery in his day, before anesthetics and before antiseptics or asepsis, was about 29%. And Esdale uh, did his three or four hundred operations with a 5% mortality. But all he got for his pains was to be violently attacked by his colleagues and hounded out of the medical profession. Um, this shows, uh, 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 indicates very clearly how right uh, James was to, to emphasize this, um, this fact that, uh, that people with a vested interest in a certain kind of uh, philosophy find it almost impossible to accept facts which go against uh, that particular philosophy. And uh, James himself went on to discuss <coughs> the reaction in his own day uh, to subjects like telepathy. The word was invented by F.W.H. Myers and was, of course, uh, the, the thing was extensively studied in the early history, the early years of the um, uh, Society for Psychical Research after 1882. Um, and James um, um, has an interesting comment on this. He says, why do so few scientists, quote, even look at the evidence for telepathy? Because they think, as a leading biologist now dead once said to me, that even if such a thing were true, scientists ought to band together to keep it suppressed and concealed. <laughs> it would make... Uh, it would undo the uniformity of nature and all sorts of things without which scientists cannot carry on their pursuits. <laughs> and uh, this is not an exaggeration because uh, at the, about the time that James was writing this, another eminent biologist, uh, Ray Lancaster, uh, st uh, resented, uh, denounced a group of his fellow scientists in Britain for taking part in an investigation of telepathy. He said it was a disgrace that any group of scientists should demean themselves by even inquiring whether such, a, uh, such evidence as had been presented could possibly be true because it couldn't, could not be true. And as late as uh, 1926, we get uh, Professor Trolland of Harvard saying that the modern psychologist tends to regard alleged psychical phenomena as the modern physicist regards perpetual motion machines. And uh, at about the same time, we have Professor Joseph Jastrow saying, obviously, uh, this is curious, obviously, obviously, if the alleged facts of psychical research were genuine and real, the labors of scientists would be futile and blind. It's uh, very difficult to see why they should be futile and blind. I mean, all that the, this seems to prove is that the uh, theory of the world on which the, the scientists were basing their uh, efforts required modification. I mean, it doesn't mean to say in the least uh, that uh, their labors were futile. And yet we find <coughs> at the present time uh, certain extremely eminent psychologists, such as Dr. Hebb of McGill, uh, speaking in exactly the same way. Uh, Hebb has a very interesting a comment on the work of Rhine, for example. He says, personally, I do not accept ESP for a moment because it does not make sense. Rhine may still turn out to be right, improbable as I think that is. And my own rejection of his views is, in a literal sense, prejudice. This reminds me of an anecdote of my grandfather, Thomas Henry Huxley, where he said of Herbert Spencer that that philosopher's conception of a tragedy was a deduction foully murdered by a fact. <laughs> <laughs> and here again, we have this, uh, this strange phenomenon of the, uh, of the apparent, of the existence apparently of facts, which because they do not fit into a certain um, type of philosophical system are com either denied or else blandly ignored. And uh, we have to, uh, to remember that this is a, 
a very deeply rooted human tendency, and it is a deplorable tendency, but uh, it, uh, it seems to be very deeply rooted, and we must take it into account. Uh, now, we have to consider the problem now of survival. <coughs> if ESP is a fact, and I think it is a fact, then there would seem to be some prima facie uh, reason to suppose that survival is a possibility. If, for example, uh, it is possible to establish some kind of communication between people without the intervention of bodily signs and without the intervention of the sense organs, then on the face of it, uh, it is possible to imagine uh, that some kind of survival after the death of the body may be possible. On the other hand, once we grant the existence of ESP, of psi phenomena, the problem of validating what appear to be the evidences for uh, survival becomes immeasurably greater because practically every case, I don't think every case, but certainly a great majority of the cases which on the face of them appeared to be veridical cases of spirit communication can, on the hypothesis that e ESP exists, be interpreted in terms of the medium's uh, uh, great ability in picking up information from the living. For example, uh, a case becomes veridical, uh, is regarded as veridical, if the alleged spirit communicator gives a piece of information which subsequently uh, is uh, found out uh, to be true. But somebody then must know it is true, and in this case, <coughs> some living person must know it is true, and in this case, obviously, uh, ESP becomes a possible explanation of the phenomena. Uh, so that we see there is this curious paradox that with the uh, establishment of ESP, and I think, uh, I personally believe it has been established, with the establishment of ESP, we have not only a, a certain intrinsic probability that there may be survival, but we also are confronted with an extraordinary difficulty in ever demonstrating uh, that a, a given phenomenon is due to survival. <coughs> uh, the, um, it is almost impossible, I think, uh, to well, anyhow, it is very difficult, difficult or perhaps almost impossible, to devise an experiment which would definitely eliminate all possibility of explanation through ESP and um, uh, definitely demonstrate a spirit survival. This, of course, is, is one of the problems which does confront uh, parapsychologists at the present time who are interested in the problem of survival, the extraordinary difficulty of setting up a, um, an experiment uh, which um, would definitely establish survival, as I say, without uh, opening the way to an explanation through a kind of extended ESP. Uh, practically all the uh, mediumistic communications, which uh, the best of which can be f uh, studied in the proceedings in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research in London and in the American Society, practically all of these, with a few exceptions, do lend themselves to perfectly plausible explanation in terms of ESP. And consequently, we have somehow uh, to think of some alternative uh, type of experiment uh, in relation to survival. And something of the same, I think, is true uh, 
in the cases of those veridical apparitions which uh, have been studied ever since 1882 and have been studied recently with great uh, thoroughness by Dr. Louisa Rhine at Duke and by Dr. Hornell Hart, who was at Duke, uh, this too uh, lends itself to the same kind of interpretation. Uh, because we know now by experience that an apparition which appears to give veridical information may be not what it seems to be, uh, something willed into existence by uh, an incorporeal personality, but the creation of the percipient. It may simply be the percipient picking up out of the psychic medium some kind of veridical information and then by means of this extraordinary dramatizing and storytelling faculty which seems to lie at the back of so many minds and especially at the back of uh, the minds of sensitives uh, building up this figure this apparitional figure uh, Dr. Louisa Ryan in her enormous collection of cases she sorts them out into degrees of uh, of uh, probability of, um, of survival. The great majority, she thinks, are the actual creations of the percipient uh, using ESP plus this dramatizing faculty. And she would regard as completely uh, evidential only cases in which um, the percipient of the apparition had no active motive for seeing the, uh, the apparition, whereas the uh, hypothetical disembodied spirit would have a very strong motive for presenting himself uh, to the percipient. And uh, some of the cases that she has collected, she's collected many thousands of them and examined them very carefully, uh, some of them come fairly near to this, uh, but uh, only one appears to uh, fully come up to, the, to this standard of complete uh, convincingness in this respect, and this particular one is not very well confirmed, unfortunately. On the other hand, um, Dr. Harnell, Hornell Hart, who has also made a considerable study of the apparitional evidence, uh, is of opinion that uh, there are many apparitions uh, apparently uh, stemming from uh, incorporeal personal agencies uh, which cannot be distinguished from the apparitions of the living. Uh, these, uh, the, one of the early classics of, uh, of psychical research was Gurney's Phantasms of the Living where he brought together a very large number of, of very interesting cases of um, apparitional appearances of people actually alive and these, this kind of census of phenomena has gone on since and uh, Hart points out that uh, in many cases these, uh, the apparitions of the dead appear to be of exactly the same nature as the apparitions of the living and uh, seeing that uh, in many cases we know that uh, apparitions of the living have been the vehicles of communication and action by uh, personalities, we may by analogy perhaps uh, imagine that some anyhow of the apparitions of the dead are also uh, vehicles of uh, personal thought and action. Well, be it as it may, <coughs> uh, there are, um, I think, um, uh, a number of cases which, in which the the weight of evidence seems on the whole to fall on the side of the survival hypothesis. Uh, that it, there are cases in which it seems to be simpler and more plausible to adopt what uh, is now called the IPA hypothesis, the incorporeal personal agency hypothesis, in favor of the ESP hypothesis. There is another point, however, which I think has to be raised uh, 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 here, uh, which is that as a matter of historical fact it is only 
fairly recently that it has been assumed that most of this kind of uh, evidence did refer to spirits of the dead. Uh, it's interesting in this context to compare, for example, what Burton in the Anatomy of Melancholy has to say on the subject with what one of the pioneers in the uh, of psychical research, F.W.H. Myers, had to say uh, 200 years later. Uh, Burton in the Anatomy of Melancholy dismisses as self-evidently absurd the idea that a departed spirit could possess what we should now call a medium and uh, impart information through the medium. Uh, he says that, these, uh, that information is given through mediums, but it does not come from departed spirits, but on the contrary, it comes from some non-human spiritual source, either divine or diabolical. Uh, F. W. H. Myers, on the other hand, completely dismisses this uh, very ancient hypothesis in favor of the uh, IPA hypothesis, the departed spirit hypothesis. And here, this again, I think, uh, is a rather disturbing fact that the same, essentially the same phenomena do lend themselves to interpretation either in terms of some kind of spirit possession, a non-human spirit possession, or to some kind of communication or possession by departed human spirits. Uh, nevertheless, I think when we have taken all these, um, these things into account, uh, it seems to me that there, are, there is enough evidence, for example, in the celebrated cross-correspondence cases, in the best uh, work of Mrs. Piper and Mrs. Leonard, uh, there seems to be enough evidence to make it reasonably plausible that something does survive bodily death. Uh, now, if we accept this evidence on its face value, if we assume that given the immense number of facts collected since 1882, since the foundation of the uh, Society for Psychical Research, if we assume that these do point to some kind of survival of a personality or a part of a personality uh, after the dissolution of the body, the next thing we have to inquire is what sort of philosophy of the universe do we have to accept in order to be able to account for this? We've seen that uh, a, an eminent uh, psychologist of the present day, such as Dr. Hebe, regards this whole thing as making no sense. Well, of course it doesn't make any sense in terms of the particular uh, hypothesis uh, the theory of the world in which um, uh, he is in, in terms of which he is carrying on his experiments and interpreting them. Obviously if you uh, believe that mind is an epiphenomenon of matter, of the action of matter, or even if you believe that mind and matter are uh, the manifestations of a single neutral substratum, unknown substratum, if you think that, uh, for example, that uh, matter, so to say, is the outside of mind, and mind is matter as experienced from the inside, uh, then neither of these views seems to be compatible uh, with uh, the idea of survival. If you accept either of these views, then the evidence, I think, both for ESP and also for survival, which is much more difficult to accept than ESP, uh, it, it quite clearly doesn't make sense. But do we have to accept uh, this, uh, this view of the world? Uh, is, it, is, the, is the fact that mental phenomena are so obviously uh, 
a function of bodily phenomena. Does this fact drive us of necessity into postulating this kind of naturalistic, materialistic monism? Well, this question was discussed many years ago by William James in his Ingersoll lecture on human immortality. <coughs> and uh, he said, of course, it, it does not necessarily uh, mean that we have to accept this kind of view of the world. Uh, he says that there are two, uh, that mind uh, uh, may be a function of, um, of matter, but that there are two kinds of functions. There is the productive function, the, where we say that mind is actually produced by some kind of material activity, uh, but there is also what he calls the transmissive function, that uh, matter, and especially the central nervous system, is the organ, the reducing valve, through which um, uh, a previously existing mind stuff uh, passes into the uh, material world. And um, uh, this view, of course, was uh, strongly supported by Bergson, and uh, it, uh, as I shall point out later on, it still has um, its adherence. And James uh, points out that the, he says that the theory of production is not a jot more simple and credible in itself than any other conceivable theory. It is only a little more popular. So that, uh, let us then distinguish between these two possible views of mind as a function of matter, the productive function, it is, is it functionally, uh, is it, uh, is the function of a productive nature or is it of a transmissive nature? Now this debate <coughs> uh, has been going on ever since James's day. And uh, let me quote here another remark of Dr. Hebbs, where he says, we have no choice but to physiologize psychology. Well, now the question is, who is we? Because he does not speak for all uh, biologists by any means. Uh, there are uh, plenty of them who do not feel that they have no choice in the matter, that they have to physiologize psychology. Uh, for example, take the case of an extremely an eminent uh, biologist, uh, Professor Joseph Needham, uh, who doesn't feel anything of the kind, that he doesn't feel at all that there is any necessity in the nature of the evidence to compel us to physiologize uh, psychology. And what he has to say on the uh, matter is this. This is how he sums it up. Mind and all mental phenomena cannot possibly receive explanation or description in physico-chemical terms, for that would amount to explaining something by an instrument which is itself the product of the thing to be explained. Uh, because obviously all uh, scientific theories, such as the scientific the theory of, uh, of naturalistic, uh, materialistic monism, is a product of the mind, and as uh, we know from the philosophers of science from Mach onwards, the, um, all these uh, um, scientific theories have a, an enormous subjective element in them and are, are themselves the most characteristic products of the mind which they seek to explain. So that uh, mind is being explained away in terms of something which is a product of mind, so that we see there is a a profound logical fallacy here. Now, Needham goes on to say, the legitimacy, the le legitimacy of physico-chemical explanations in the realm of physical life is well grounded, but we have found that as far as mental life is concerned, biochemistry and biophysics have no authority. The opinion, therefore, which seems to me most justifiable is that life in all its forms uh, 
is the phenomenal disturbance created in the world of matter and energy when mind comes into, um, comes into it. Living matter is the outward and visible sign of the uh, uh, outward and visible sign uh, of the uh, presence of, uh, of mind, the splash made by the entry of mental existence into the sea of matter. And he concludes this essay by saying, the biochemist and the biophysicist can and must be thoroughgoing mechanists, but they need not on that account hesitate to say with Sir Thomas Brown, there is something in us that can be without us and will be after us. Now, <clears throat> I quote this in order to show that the transmission theory is a, is a perfectly live theory at the present time and that there is, uh, philosophically, it seems to be better founded perhaps than the production theory. That uh, we, uh, there is no uh, compulsion for us to accept the production theory and therefore no compulsion for us to accept a theory which means that ESP or even IPA are uh, things which make no sense. They do make sense in terms of a transmission theory. Now the transmission theory obviously is related to the old Platonic and Cartesian uh, theories uh, but uh, is considerably more subtle, say, than the, the, the Cartesian theory. Uh, Descartes postulated the relationship of uh, mind and matter uh, in a, a much too limited way. He, he spoke of, uh, of mind as being something whose essence is consciousness, uh, being related uh, to matter whose essence is extension, uh, and that each mind being completely watertight and separate from all other minds. But of course now we are able to, to see that his uh, cogito ergo sum, his I think therefore I am, uh, should be really modified as von Bader, the romantic German philosopher of the early 19th century modified it, when he said that cogito ergo sum should be revised and that we should say cogitor ergo sum, I am thought, therefore I am. We are thought by an immensely much larger subliminal mind than the, this conscious ego of which uh, we are aware. And in the, the, any kind of reasonable and realistic transmission theory, we have to postulate, I think, that this uh, subliminal mind in which our self-conscious ego floats, so to speak, like a, a kind of crystal within a, a, a sea, uh, within a solution. Uh, this uh, subliminal mind is not cut off from all other minds, that it communicates <coughs> somehow with, with all other minds in a kind of, of psychic medium. And that... Um, we are, in a certain sense, like, uh, like crystals floating within this, this medium and communicating with other crystals through the medium. Well, Bergson uh, accepted this view and maintained that, uh, intrinsically, the mind was virtually omniscient and that it, it merely, it was not, in fact, omniscient here and now because uh, for the benefit of the animal who has to survive on the surface of this planet, we cannot be omniscient because we should be so full of irrelevant information that we should simply not be able to get out of the way of the cars in the street. <laughs> and consequently, the nervous system, central nervous system in the brain, exists in order to limit this virtually endless quantity of consciousness which we virtually have, to limit it and to funnel it through for the purposes of uh, biological survival on the surface of this particular planet. Well, my own feeling is, I, I, would, I would think that this idea of a, 
a completely omniscient mind is, is a little, seems to me a little fantastic. But I, I would think that there is something to be said for a view <coughs> which would say that the, this uh, psychic medium, whatever it may be, uh, is, let us say, virtually omniscient. That it, is, it could take on into itself every kind of specialized information, but that, uh, what it is in itself is a kind of undifferentiated consciousness. And uh, as I shall try to point out later on in this lecture, uh, there is a lot of evidence from the part of the, uh, on the part of the mystics, both East and West, uh, to the effect that our particular specialized, individualized consciousness is underlain by an undifferentiated consciousness. And that this undifferentiated consciousness possesses uh, what the Catholic mystics call obscure knowledge. This is a very curious and interesting phrase which we meet with very frequently in the literature of mysticism. Uh, they speak, uh, the mystics constantly speak of this obscure knowledge of the world, which is not a particular knowledge of uh, how to make uh, sulfuric acid or what is the distance of the nearest fixed star and so on. It is uh, a generalized knowledge in the individual, an awareness of this total underlying awareness which uh, as I say, underlies all particular awarenesses, that, that, that this, this um, obscure knowledge of the universe uh, is, I think, uh, a, a direct awareness of the undifferentiated consciousness, mental, mentoid state, uh, which uh, underlies all particular consciousnesses. <coughs> now, uh, uh, we exist within this undifferentiated awareness as, so to speak, a, a succession of vortices in a, in a liquid. We have, unfortunately, our psychological vocabulary is so extremely poor that we are always driven back to use these uh, material and spatial metaphors. But we must always remember that uh, when we use material and spatial metaphors, that we use them in a, that they are necessarily very misleading in as much as this, this mental, uh, uh, this under differentiated consciousness is not in space and time, and it does not uh, have the characteristics of a material medium. Nevertheless, we, we have to, because, simply because we do not have the necessary vocabulary, uh, to speak in these sort of terms. We have to use analogies with uh, vortices. Well, it is as though uh, we were persistent vortices within a medium. And I think we have to postulate that by our experience in the embodied state, we build up these particular awarenesses within the general undifferentiated awareness, and that we leave certain traces in the form of persistent vortices upon the undifferentiated medium, that these things uh, go on. Uh, now, the question then arises, uh, what, what are these uh, vortices within the undifferentiated awareness? Uh, here, there's some, I think we find some very interesting suggestions from the Oxford philosopher H. H. Price, who speaks of, uh, of these different types of, uh, uni of uh, uh, so to say, the molecules of awareness, which may be of any, uh, the complexes of awareness may be of any size, so to speak, from a, a single idea, from from a haunting, for example, to go back to the question of survival, this uh, purely non-personal thing which seems to remain attached to a certain place, uh, up to a f large fragment of a personality and perhaps to a complete personality. 
Now, we pronounce this word personality, and it's a word we use very glibly. But when we come to examine exactly what it means, we are confronted by very great difficulties. What, what precisely is a personality? Uh, when we look uh, closely at personalities, our own or other people, uh, what do we find? Uh, well, I think the first thing that we are struck by is that any given personality is certainly not a monolithic unity. Uh, the personality is a good deal more loosely uh, bundled together than we ordinarily think. And it is, uh, it is a non-unitary thing. It is made of, of disparate elements, uh, both in its temporal extension and in its cross-section. In its temporal extension, uh, obviously we, uh, we change very considerably um, as we grow older. But in, it's not merely a question of maturation that changes the personality. It's quite clear if we look at the history of almost any life that there may be profound <coughs> changes of the personality uh, brought about by particular circumstances. I mean, let us take a hypothetical case of a, of a child <coughs> whose mother dies and who from having been a happy and completely healthy personality becomes a very wretched and neurotic personality. I mean, here is a, a startling change in the nature of the personality. Uh, and uh, similarly, changes of surroundings, uh, casual meetings, may make the most profound difference to people. I mean, one often hears of uh, cases of, of people who seem to be almost moronic, who uh, suddenly find what their talents are, what they can do. A chance meeting uh, opens up a new world for them, and from having been practically idiotic, uh, they become alert and intelligent and efficient, and uh, one sees that there is a profound change in the personality. And after all, it's one of the commonplaces of religious literature that certain types of religious experience will produce immense changes in personality, that they the whole attitude towards life, towards other human beings, uh, the whole way of behaving will change profoundly. And the whole, consequently, the whole stock of memories, uh, which obviously become extremely important in the problem of survival, will be totally changed. And um, uh, similarly, uh, in the... Uh, cross sections of a personality at any given time, there are again obviously uh, disparate uh, elements brought together. After all, there is the conscious and the unconscious, uh, there is the rational and the childish in human beings, uh, there is the respectable persona and the generally rather disreputable psychophysiological reality which lies beneath it. Uh, all these things are there as, um, uh, as very loosely connected bits of the personality. Uh, and uh, so this leads us to ask, what, what exactly do we mean by a, a personality? Do we mean what I think I am, or what I would wish to be, or what the Freudian analyst interprets me as being, or what my friends think I am. Uh, there are obviously a great many uh, ways in which a personality uh, can be thought about. And um, then, on top of everything else, we have to remember that there are, in every personality, immense numbers of, uh, an indefinite number, I think, of pot potentialities which might have been developed in other circumstances, but which in the particular circumstances of the life have not been developed. So that uh, over and above all the other enigmas of personality, there is this, this immense enigma of the, uh, 
of the might have been, the, the fact that we carry about immense latent uh, potentialities which have not, in fact, been actualized, but which might have been actualized. Well, now, from this, let us return to the question of survival. Uh, now, let us assume that the evidence which points to something surviving is valid. Now, the question arises, what is it uh, that is actually surviving? Now, I would agree with uh, Professor C.D. Broad, who is uh, one of the rather few philosophers who has really taken the trouble to study the uh, literature of uh, psychical research with great care and has devoted a, a lot of speculation to the problem. I would agree with uh, Professor Broad uh, in thinking that in most cases, certainly, what survives and what comes through in the uh, communications with the medium or the percipient uh, is perhaps not a complete personality, whatever exactly that may be, uh, but is, is rather a, a fragment of a personality, that a piece comes through and uh, establishes some kind of communication with the percipient in life. <coughs> and in this case, we would have to assume that uh, these traces left in the psychic medium, this, these surviving uh, vortices, uh, have some sort of power of being, of establishing communication with um, the, uh, uh, the percipient and sometimes bringing through some kind of veridical information. But uh, as I say, in the majority of cases, it does look as though what is coming through is, is not a total personality, but only a piece of one. This may be because the communication is extraordinarily difficult between one mode of being and another. But uh, on the whole, I think we have to, th to envisage this possibility uh, that uh, what, what in general is coming through is only a fragment of a personality. Now, <clears throat> this means that it, it may be possible for the same human being uh, to survive in several fragments simultaneously. For example, let us take the case of a boy X and a boy Y. The boy, uh, the, these are close friends in their boyhood. The boy X dies. The boy Y goes on and lives to a ripe old age. Now, <coughs> presumably, if there is survival, uh, the personality or some fragment of the personality of the boy X associates with the vortex which left in the psychic medium by Y when he was a boy. I mean, he may be associating with something that Y has left behind him, even while Y is still alive. That it, it seems to me perfectly on the cards that uh, uh, there may be this uh, survival of bits of personalities which may communicate with uh, disembodied personalities, even while the uh, the first personality is still in life and that the, the this uh, the boy x and the boy uh, and the the boy who was y will perhaps go on associating and here uh, i mean quite obviously seeing that this is a, a purely mental and subjective life which is going on in the psychic medium we must assume that the association is necessarily through similarity or through some other kind of uh, psychological congruity, that there, there, there is not a, a, an association through any spatial or chemical relationship, but solely through some uh, psychic uh, congruity between the two groups of 
surviving experiences. Well, now we may pursue this uh, still further and assume that, uh, that why, as he grows older, uh, let us assume that he marries and he loses his wife after a few years, uh, marries again, and then in later life has an accident which, say, reduces him to imbecility. Well, here he is already, or his personality is broken up into a number of fragments, each of which uh, may leave its traces behind in the, so, uh, in the uh, psychic medium and associate with those uh, surviving fragments of the people with whom he associated during life <coughs> So that uh, he will, as I say, perhaps uh, survive in uh, several forms at the same time. Uh, this, uh, I think, is a, is a genuine uh, possibility. Uh, now, Suppose that we now have to come to a very curious and difficult point. Suppose this kind of association of um, fragments of personality is possible within the uh, psychic medium. What, what can happen? I mean, suppose that uh, we, we assume that these uh, vortices which remain can associate with similar vortices what what um, what can we envisage uh, in this um, posthumous life? Here, let me quote <coughs> a curious and interesting passage uh, where C. D. Broad has discussed this. Well, he says, when we consider analogies with persistent vortices, stationary waves, transmitting beams, etc we can envisage a number of interesting and fantastic possibilities. We can think of the possibility of partial coalescence, partial mutual annulment or reinforcement, interference, etc., between the psi components of several deceased um, human beings, in conjunction, perhaps, <coughs> with non-human flotsam and jetsam, which may exist around us. There are reported mediumistic phenomena and pathological mental cases not ostensibly involving mediumship which suggest that some of these disturbing possibilities may sometimes be realized. And then he adds, it is worthwhile to remember, though there is nothing we can do about it, that the world as it really is may easily be a far nastier place than it would be if scientific materialism were the whole truth and nothing but the truth. This is a rather characteristic um, summing up by Broad, who has said in a wry sort of way that he would be more, uh, slightly more annoyed than surprised to find himself surviving. Uh, uh, and it is characteristic of him to see only that the world might be a considerably nastier place but he might have added I think that the world also may be a considerably nicer place uh, and for the evidence of this let us turn for a moment uh, to the whole mystical tradition uh, here I think there is, uh, I cannot see why we should reject the evidential nature of much of this mystical tradition. This has uh, gone on for an immense time, both in the East and the West, this conception of this underlying, undifferentiated consciousness, this divine ground, this mother sea of cosmic consciousness, as William James called it, uh, with which, uh, by suitable practices, individuals can become <coughs> aware, become uh, unified, even during this life. 
And uh, this uh, operational process, for, for it, this is what essentially it is, uh, the ori all Oriental philosophy is essentially a kind of transcendental operationalism which uh, provides certain techniques for producing certain changes in consciousness and which then goes out into speculation uh, to give a metaphysical explanation for the nature of the, uh, of the change of consciousness. And the fundamental uh, formula for uh, describing, for, uh, for interpreting these uh, changed states of consciousness is, of course, the ancient uh, Indian formula, formula tattva masi, thou art that. The, uh, or as the Buddhists say, mind with a small m from mind with a large m is not divided. Uh, or again, as Eckhart would say, that the ground of the soul is the, um, identical with the ground of the Godhead. Uh, now, in relation uh, to survival, what, a, um, what does this mean? Uh, it means that immortality in the sense in which the mystics use the word, they don't use the word survival so much as immortality, that immortality is the continuation into the post-mortem life of the kind of awareness of the divine ground which can be attained in this life. And in this context I would like to make some quotations from this, perhaps one of the most remarkable of all pieces of religious literature, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, <coughs> which is a kind of handbook for helping the dead person through the intermediate state between lives. The, uh, this is a Buddhist work of Tantric Buddhism, and the Buddhists, of course, assume uh, that uh, there is uh, reincarnation. This has always been taken for granted in the Far East, and incidentally, in, in our own Western tradition, uh, David Hume said that the only form of immortality which uh, a uh, philosophic mind could accept was that of reincarnation. I don't think we have to discuss whether this is true or not, but uh, the, uh, the point is that the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead uh, speaks of the possibility of communicating with the departed spirit immediately after death and helping it in this intermediate state between lives. If the person who dies can be made to be aware of the basic fact of the mind from mind being not divided, then he can escape from the wheel of birth and death and enter into this timeless immortality. And the Tibetan Book of the Dead makes the following statement that at the moment of death the dead person becomes aware of this undifferentiated consciousness, which in the language of Mahayana Buddhism is called the clear light. He becomes aware of this, and if during his lifetime he has practiced this awareness, he is able to associate himself with this. If he has practiced during his lifetime the realization that thou art that, that the, the basic, uh, uh, the foundation of his own, the ground of his own existence is identical with the ground of the universe, then he can unify, unite himself with the clear light and escape from the uh, horrors of birth and of continuous birth and death. But the chances are, of course, that he will not have, I mean, the overwhelming probability is that he will not have been, uh, have achieved this kind of uh, enlightenment during life, and so will not be able to accept the pure light, the clear light as it is presented to him. It, in fact, it will seem intolerably brilliant and impossible to bear, and he will then have to go on to a series of, of less 
intense lights. In all these stages, as he goes down, he can get back to immortality, but the, the difficulty becomes greater and greater, and he will pass then through a stage of, uh, of wild, visionary illusions, and finally will come down to the <coughs> point where he has to re-enter a womb and be born again, merely to escape from the intolerable purity and brilliance of the clear light. It is a, it's a very powerful conception, which is not unlike uh, St. Catherine of Genoa's conception of purgatory, where the pain of the, of the suffering souls in purgatory is the pain of being impure in relation to this supremely pure light of God, which is then experienced as fire. And in this uh, conception, in the, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, we see something similar, that the, the clear light is of a degree of purity so great that uh, the majority of people can't stand it and have to go down finally into this comforting world of flesh once more. But now let me read uh, the, the passage which, uh, with which the priest speaks to the dying man uh, and goes on speaking when the breath has ceased. What he says, O nobly born, the clear light seen at the moment of death, uh, um, you are now aware of the clear light seen at the moment of uh, death. Now thou art experiencing the radiance of the clear light of pure reality. Recognize it. Thy present intellect, in its real nature void, undifferentiated, naturally void, is the very reality, the all good. Thine own intellect, which is now voidness, yet not to be regarded as, a, as of the voidness of nothingness, but as being mind in itself, unobstructed, shining, thrilling and blissful, is the very consciousness, the all good Buddha. Thine own consciousness, shining, void, and inseparable from the great body of radiance, uh, has no birth nor death, and is the immortal and the light. Knowing this is sufficient. And this knowledge <coughs> of the clear light, of the undifferentiated consciousness, underlying our ego consciousness, <coughs> seems to be also among Western mystics the, the conception of the essence of immortality. Uh, for example, Meister Eckhart says that for an enlightened soul, and he was obviously speaking from uh, personal experience, uh, he, he says that uh, for the soul which has purified itself, uh, such a soul enjoys, even in this life, all that it will enjoy in the eternal life, that already there is eternity here and now in this knowledge of the undifferentiated ground of all uh, particular awarenesses. And I shall conclude with a, uh, an anecdote which is told about uh, Jakob Burma, the uh, great Protestant mystic of the early 17th century. He was asked by a young friend, where does the soul go after death? And he replied, there is no need for it to go anywhere. The reason being that if the soul has been properly prepared, it is, so to say, there already. And this, uh, over and against the the whole problem of survival, which the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead regards as ending necessarily in the reincarnation, is set over against this uh, mystical idea of immortality, of participating in the uh, divine ground of all being. And I think we uh, should always uh, make this distinction. I don't think uh, we make it sufficiently uh, strongly that, the, that survival is not necessarily uh, 
a divine state at all. It may be just uh, exactly on, on a par with uh, the sort of life that uh, is being lived now by the average sensual man. But, and, but there is always a possibility for anybody who is prepared uh, to fulfill the conditions. There is always a possibility of achieving this uh, union with the clear light, uh, which is uh, of the essence of immortality. Uh, it may be, of course, a complete uh, melting away into the totality of mind, or it may be, as the uh, mystics have uh, constantly uh, assured us uh, the, well, what is possible during life, it may be a continuation of individualized awareness, transfigured, so to say, by the light of this knowledge of the undifferentiated ground of all being, so that there is a possibility both in this world and, if there is, and in the next of a kind of individual awareness in which the soul, so to say, makes the best of both worlds, where the, the absolute is not apart from the world, but is seen in the relative, where the, as Blake says, the, you see uh, infinity in a grain of sand and eternity in a flower, uh, that uh, there is a, a possibility, as I say, if the ground of our own being has been realized as identical with the ground of all being, uh, of a continuing personal existence which shall uh, have the quality both of the absoluteness of the divine ground and of the individualized life. This is naturally, as all the fundamental truths of life, uh, this is a, a huge paradox which uh, makes no sense, of course, uh, except insofar as it is a fact of experience. Thank you.